Okay, it's four o'clock, and uh, I think we should get started. Particularly, I have to go through a page of uh, introduction. <laughs> when John saw me do this, he said, do I have time to give my talk? Um, in fact, it's the first time I actually typed up my introduction. Um, and uh, it's, uh, so I'm delighted to introduce John Jumper, uh, today's Apex lecture speaker. And it's befitting and actually fortunate for us that John is uh, the inaugural speaker for the Center for Applied AI in Protein Dynamics and, uh, of course, in co collaboration with Dean's office. John, as you, many of you may know, he's one of the pioneers of the brave new AI world. Uh, John's contribution through AlphaFold 2 has revolutionized protein science by answering an age-old question that resisted some of the brightest minds of our time. Um, I can recall many meetings and satellite meetings that promised to finally conquer the protein folding problem only to discover that the moats are too wide to cross and the walls are too, high, too tall or too high to scale. The holy grail that is the protein folding code sat undisturbed for many decades, holding secrets that one can argue are still beyond our intelligence despite the success of artificial intelligence. Um, so those of us of distinguished, distinguished age, like myself, fondly, fondly remember that protein, the, the protein folding instability was one of the most fascinating chapter when we took protein chemistry. So yeah, there was a day when protein chemistry was a required class in biomedical science. And in those days, the, in, the instructor would painstakingly walk us through calculation of the free energy of folding of a hypothetical protein. Equally riveting was the presentation of the Leventhal paradox, invoking a ticking clock measure, measuring the age of the universe as a protein helplessly is lost in its own entropy space. Uh, so I remember that the powers of tens, we had 10 to the 70, 10 to the 80 for a small protein, um, that characterized this comparison put to rest at least my physicist naive view that all problems can be answered by application of the Schrodinger's equation. So um, really, uh, uh, one of the stories that will be of 2020, and it's actually a coincidence that 2020 saw many scientific triumphs. One of them is uh, the vaccine for COVID, but also saw uh, the emergence of AlphaFold 2. And, and this final battle to, to conquer uh, the protein folding problem was not only fascinating because of the outcome, because of the success, but also because um, uh, how scientists, how the DeepMind team over came the, the moats and walls that I've spoken about. The strategy invoked explosive conversions of multiple trends in technology and leveraging private enterprise power, compute power. So these are probably going to shape the future of science. And I'm not going to talk about AlphaFold, of course, but I'm going to spare you my naive take on it, and John will talk about that. But I wanted to uh, make one more point uh, before I introduce the man. Um, and uh, about, uh, so, so what one can discuss the far-reaching far, uh, impact that AlphaFold will have not only on protein science, but also on biomedicine in general, that we're starting to see actually. And we can, we can think about the profound implications of AI on the scientific method itself. But one of the things that I thought about last night, for me, um, uh, AF2, since the dawn of AF, uh, AF2, I just realized that I am part of uh, this incredible enterprise that every few years will surprise us with revolution that stretches our imagination and, in my case, challenged me to reinvent what I do. Okay, so a few words about John. Uh, as, you, as many of you know, he's an alumnus of Vanderbilt University, having done a degree in math and physics and graduated in 2007. And uh, so he's very young and uh, fits the, the, what I read. I read a quote by uh, Thomas Kuhn, the, 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 the author of The Structure of Scientific Revolution. He said that individuals who break through by inventing a new paradigm are almost always, always either very young men or very new to the field who, whose paradigms they change. These are the men who, being little committed by prior practice to the traditional rules of normal science. 
From Vanderbilt, John traveled to the University of Chicago, uh, so the University of Cambridge in England, where he did a Master of Phil in uh, condensed matter phys physics. Then he did a PhD in the University of Chicago, working with Carl Fried and Tobin Sosnick. And then, uh, um, and then bef uh, before that, he actually worked at the D.E. Shaw Research Group, where he dabbled with molecular dynamics simulation and came up with the idea that maybe he shouldn't be doing molecular dynamics simulation, and that catalyzed him going into the AI field, into machine learning and deep learning. And after finishing his PhD, he went to um, DeepMind, and then there was AlphaFold. So here's John Jumper and the story of AlphaFold. That's quite the introduction. I may have to skip all the introductory slides, but no, it's, it's wonderful to be back. It's wonderful to be back at Vanderbilt and see uh, which parts of the campus are still there and which parts have been built over. Um, all my old dorms have been destroyed to make much more beautiful buildings. Towers will not be missed. And uh, yeah, it's, it's been a really great place and a really formative place. And yeah, I think lots of us that worked on AlphaFold Maybe, you know, we knew this problem was going to be hard. If we knew how hard it was going to be, we probably wouldn't have gotten started. But I think it's been a, a wonderful thing, and I think it's also been wonderful how people have used it. And okay, I'll talk about AlphaFold, some of what I think it means, some of what people are using it for, and also I think what, what is it going to take, or how are we going to get the next kind of breakthroughs? What areas will we find them in? And so, okay, AlphaFold is a very, very simple thing. And uh, my bad joke about this is that it's a system for computational alchemy, that you have a base metal of protein sequence and you want to transmute it into the uh, gold of protein structure. And uh, we have a simple system in the middle and you can kind of think of it, okay, there's got to be, you know, I prefer to even think of Anfinson. Anfinson said there should be an answer, that there is some you know, that the protein sequence determines the protein structure, like all in biology, that's not quite true, but it's kind of true. Um, the Center for Protein Dynamics is about all the places that's not true. But, uh, but how are we gonna do this and how are we gonna think about it? And this has been really a problem that has captured people's interest for 50 plus years, that, they're, that this is complex, but not so complex that we can't imagine uh, doing something about it. And, of course, I'm up here talking because we did something about it. And uh, so you can find some picked cherries here of uh, structure predictions. And throughout most of the talk, uh, green will be ground truth in the language of machine learners, but uh, PDB structures. And blue will be predicted structures, in this case, totally blind. Uh, we didn't know the answer when we made these predictions. And really pulling lots and lots of molecular detail and often side chain detail. And, and really surprising how well this matches even for very complex things. And I'll briefly mention that we have even a new version that if you haven't tried AlphaFold uh, version 2.3, and this was really aimed at larger structures and enabled by more recent data from CryoEM. And so a lot of things that were difficult to do with AlphaFold out of the box before now just work immediately or sometimes stitch together. Um, and so really big things out to around, well, all right, moderate things if you're a uh, cryo-EM scientist, but big things if you're a crystallographer uh, really start to work now. So you might, if it hasn't worked on your problem before, you might give it a, a second try. But I want to tell you a little bit about the methods. Why, why were we able to do this? And compute was a part of the story, but there were also a lot of ideas and perspective. And this wasn't just really okay, well, we'll just take machine learning and we'll apply it to the problem and it will yield immediately and I'll talk a bit about why that is. And of course, you know, there's, I should start and say there's a tremendous amount of data, as you all know, experimental protein structures. Here I'm representing um, crystallography because the pictures of the machine are much more impressive than for uh, cryo-EM. But this is really extraordinarily, extraordinarily uh, difficult, right? The crystallization especially. One of my you know, favorite sentences I saw in a paper after we'd made a you know, prediction for AlphaFold, and, oh, well, we'll look up the paper. I want to read something about it. And one of the sentences was, after about a year, crystals began to form, right? And that was probably not the first thing they tried and put in the refrigerator um, or in the freezer. 
And so it's this extraordinarily difficult task of getting these large complex objects to form crystals. And now we take it into colossally large scientific instruments in order to get bright x-rays, in order to image it. And then we must mathematically solve it, in this case, the phase problem, which doesn't always work, um, to finally deposit. And so this is uh, exceptionally difficult. I like to say very rough estimate of a year of a PhD student time, of extremely skilled time still to get these structures. And this is extremely important, and it's so important we've done it 200,000 times despite how difficult it is and deposited in PDB or many more. But we've had the sequencing revolution. We know billions of protein sequences. In fact, if you compare the growth rate of, say, Uniprod and PDB, we're learning sequences about 3,000 times faster than we're experimentally determining structures. And so we've got this incredible gap, and that's even before you consider interactions, only about something like a fourth of the residues in the human proteome. Obviously, some of them are going to be disordered or covered by an experimental structure, but there's still this enormous gap. And as we start to think about how are we going to use this to understand not just the isolated systems we're studying, but how are we going to use this to understand the cell, kind of how are we going to tackle the 20,000 protein coding genes, we really have to get to computational solutions. Um, and at the same time, there's been an incredible worldwide effort and a tremendous amount of foresight by Helen Berman and others to collect these data and make it available and really be, and that you can't publish a paper on a structure without depositing it. Making, you know, this project benefited from two of the greatest resources and most clean data resources in biology, one being the PDB, the other being the sequence databases, Uniprod and metagenomics databases. And really the foresight to do this was extremely important. And so you have not just a data set or not just a large data set, but something that represents the diversity of interests of the structural biology community. So if you manage to learn this, you're learning on across a tremendous uh, range of systems. And in fact, you're learning something probably very generalizable that you wouldn't learn on 200,000 structures of different ligands against a single protein or something very narrow. And so you have this very general, relatively clean, you know, if you ask structural biologists, they say it's, you know, full of all sorts of things you shouldn't believe. But if you ask machine learners, you say it's amazing. Uh, <laughs> data set of, um, of protein structures that we're able to start from. So we had really at the start of this project, and we weren't, we didn't know this, we had had probably years, decade more where we had enough structures in order to solve this, but we didn't have the ideas, the compute, everything else to bring together with that data and kind of do the second half of the problem and do the machine learning. And so, uh, you know, here's a kind of top-level diagram of AlphaFold. And what I'll encourage you is not to look at this too hard or not to think about this too hard. I don't think this is the way that you should think about AlphaFold and machine learning and getting into why did we recycle three times and not five. Well, five was probably better anyway. Um, is really about what are the principles of doing this? How do we build this? And really, I think as we did this project, we found we were, you know, there's the science of proteins that's really well developed and understood. There's a science of machine learning that's being developed, or general machine learning. But there was a big gap in what is protein machine learning? How do we adapt these ideas um, for the problems we have? And what kind of difference will that make? And so, you know, there's been a long history of clever ideas both on structure and on evolution. And if you think about it, a lot of people like to talk about causality in machine learning. And the sequence causes the energy landscape in a kind of, and of the structure indirectly. And the structure provides this constraint via function on the evolutionary history. And there's been this clever set of ideas that go back to the early 90s and before of evolutionary structural prediction. And they're often expressed, I think, in two narrow terms, in terms of uh, covariation or profiles or other things. But I think the way to think of it is kind of a Bayesian sense in which, well, if the structure had an influence on evolution, and we can measure lots and lots of evolution thanks to the genomics revolution, then maybe looking at all that evolution will tell us something about the structure, right? So if A causes B and you have a whole bunch of Bs that were caused by A, maybe you can learn something about it. And so this has been this kind of field of evolutionary structure prediction. It's been very important and in some ways almost disappointing. All of us wanted to say, well, you know, I was trained as a physicist right here and said, you know, we shall good, good atomic physics shall uh, carry the day and we shall learn free energies and we shall use atomic free energies. But of course, the cell is a very complex place. 
And we have this really useful piece of information on evolution. Um, but at the same time, we needed another component. And you know, deep learning has been a big story for several years now. And really, it's been a story. And a, like one of the classic theorems in machine learning is, oh, this is universal, that any function given enough data can be learned by this or that neural network block. And in practice, people have found they make kind of specialized blocks, like convolutional used in images, graph uh, networks, attention more recently, what's in transformers. And these blocks are super generic. In fact, they show up in speech recognition. They show up in chat bots. They show up in image generation. They're too generic. They don't know anything about proteins. These are kind of really clever ideas for how to build effective learning systems. But, they, oh, but because they can learn anything, they need lots of data to learn proteins and protein structure. And so if you look at kind of our AlphaFold 1 system, it was a convolutional network. It was really a very standard image recognition network fed protein data. And that does work at some level, but it doesn't make efficient use. The data is not at the scale, say, web scale data. And so we need some of our cleverness being put into how we design these building blocks and how we take these ideas from ML and we take these ideas from proteins. And we started during the project, we developed what I would kind of call principles. And people say, well, what was the one idea? And I think what people even mean maybe, what was the one formula that gave you AlphaFold? And it, it wasn't a story like that. It was a story of many small ideas com coming together and really within a kind of idea that maybe we need to build our physical or geometric, you know, I was trained as a biophysicist in grad school. How do we build what we know from biophysics? How do we build that into the network structure in just the right way? Um, how also do we really get neural networks previously to this work? There'd been no really accurate systems that were what's called end-to-end, -end, that in goes, say, the sequence, out comes the protein structure, and that's important because you want to change everything along the way to make the final structure right. And then how do we build this funny word of inductive biases? But you've all used inductive biases whenever you've had, say, you know, thermal melt or guan melt data, and you fit it with a sigmoid for good reason rather than fitting it with a straight line or fitting it with an arbitrary polynomial because you want the physical form of the functions you use to be aligned with the kind of problems they're solving. Now, it's not so simple in proteins, and we kind of had to get there and iterate. But we knew a couple things going in, that a lot of the work in, say, convolutional networks really worked in primary sequence or pairs of primary sequences. And that's great. Primary sequence is important. But you've got a problem, is that when protein folds, right, something hundreds and hundreds of positions away can be geometrically right next to this other residue. So there are all these new connections that if I handed you a protein structure, you might say, oh, well, I'll propagate information locally in MD or with a graph net. But of course, we started without knowing the structure. So how do we not emphasize these local connections that we know at the beginning? How do we emphasize long range connections as we discover structure? And how do we handle uncertainty that you'll then in effect, you'll have hypotheses. You'll start to think, if you imagine how might you build a structure, how might you solve a jigsaw puzzle? Well, you'll find some things you're pretty sure fit together, some things you're less sure or you have theories about. How do you handle all of these within the neural network? And I think all of these kind of are general ideas and approaches, and then you have to find the specific formulas that enable you to learn this. And so to kind of dig into how we use these ideas, I'll concentrate on one part, the Evo former block. This is um, the main kind of piece of the network. And actually, for people, I should probably put in a little bit more about how. Do we have a laser pointer? Uh, nope. Uh, OK. So um, how, how this works is. Um, when you train a neural network, you have lots of data. Oh, thank you. You, have, you start here, and you have kind of the structure of this function in which you can put in data here, and it flows through basically everywhere there's a line. It flows through the pipes. And then eventually it produces an answer. And if this is something that you're doing at training, this is a protein that appears in PDB, so you knew its input sequence, you knew its output. And of course, the first answer you produce is very wrong. It won't look that good. And so 
What you do, though, is you say, how, where do I need to go in order to make this a little more correct? Let's say that this uh, loop is too far out and it needs to bend up to here a little bit. Well, you apply a small change and you back propagate, you figure out how would I change every parameter here and every parameter here to make a small change toward being more correct, to having a smaller distance between this answer and the right answer. And then you make that small change and then you go to the next protein and you do it again. And you do this until you go through uh, the PDB many, many times, in fact, tens of millions of um, individual protein samples trained on, of course, with different parameters each time. But then the question becomes, well, what do you want in here? This is just like the kind of nonlinear curve fitting you do, but what kind of pieces do we want? And so rather than starting from kind of a machine learning pairwise data or something else, let's start from kind of a physical data. We have one input that is, comes from the multiple sequence alignment. We have one input that starts initially with almost no information, which is the residue pair data, which is really kind of separations between. So each of these little locations represents one pair of amino acids. And you can think of this as kind of how we're thinking about geometry or what we believe about geometry, who's close, who's far. And you can think of this one as what do we think about evolution? How do we think about phylogeny? What are the different pieces of data that we're processing here and, and protein sequences across different organisms? Now, if you think about those as concepts, then almost immediately if you were processing or if you were doing some function on here, well, as you process the data from this protein sequence, well, if you knew something about the structure, that's useful information. So we update the information in our multiple sequence alignment using kind of standard neural network operations that people would recognize, but we bias it by our beliefs about the pair structure and across each of these are kind of learned parameters. And so we have a newly processed multiple sequence alignment that is reflecting our knowledge that we've built thus far within uh, pairwise sequence information. So in essence, we think about evolution in the light of geometry if you want to think, or in the light of physics. Now, of course, with evolution, there's lots of uh, known relationships. For example, co-evolving pairs tend to have a higher probability of being close to each other, or some of these residues, for example, the profile will indicate some are hydrophobic, some are hydrophilic. So what you believe about the geometry and the residue pairs, you should update based on what you've learned about evolution. So we're basically moving information here from geometry into evolution, and here we're taking information from evolution back down into geometry. And in each of these cases, we didn't write out an extraordinarily complicated formula. We instead kind of drew these connections and put relatively standard and relatively flexible pieces on them, a certain operation called outer product mean in this case. And at the same time, we process the pair data to make it more consistent. If you think about if you have beliefs about how close things are, well, there's lots about these beliefs that can be inconsistent, right? They're in protein residues, they're in squared pairs, or another way to say it is, you know, if I'm close to John and John's close to Hassan, I can't be too far away from Hassan, right? That's the triangle inequality. And so we put in a bunch of special kind of connection paths that help it update its geometric information in the hopes that it will be more consistent. And of course, what exactly it does across each of these blocks has been trained by the network, but the inspiration is how do we do the kind of operations we think about that we might want to do? How do we express these as connections? And what we found is every time we kind of got this right in a good way, that the neural network that we would train would learn more from the same amount of data. Of course, we have a very fixed amount of data in the PDB, and each of these kind of alignments took some pressure off the data. So if you think about it, if you have a very, very general thing, then all of your protein knowledge has to come from staring at PDB, right? Which, you know, in some sense humans did, but we're very smart. Um, if, if you put some of the intelligence into how you build the network, then you take some of the pressure off. You have more facts that don't have to be learned, you have kind of more careful connections. And that enables learning much more efficiently. And in fact, kind of doing this and many other things, there's an interesting study by Muhammad al-Qureshi where he said, okay, well, if you compare AlphaFold 2 
on artificially, on randomly throwing proteins out of the PDB, you can throw out 98, 99% of the PDB and get the same accuracy as our earlier AlphaFold1 system. And that's really saying that all of these kind of large modifications that we did in order to increase the efficiency of learning meant that we're somewhere 50, 100 times more efficient in extracting information from data. And so the real kind of story, and then the interesting question becomes, what new things did you learn? I'll talk about that in a little bit. But the story is kind of that machine learning, and I think one of the things that's maybe not well represented, assuming I don't have a tremendous number of machine learners in the audience, um, that's not well represented in the kind of media is you assume there's one algorithm and you throw everything in, and okay, transformers are very popular now, but there's quite a lot of science and understanding and experimenting how we train these, what we do with them, and that's really, really important in terms of what is learned. That's kind of the science of the machine learning, and we understood that in some contexts, but we didn't understand that in the protein context, and we didn't know how to pull it in, and this was our attempt to do it over many iterations. Now we can start to ask the question, though, well, what was learned, or how do we get into this? Or, you know, there's the reputation, and not all entirely undeserved. There's a total black box that we have no idea how anything works. And I think that's not quite true, but we had intuitions, and we could tell. And it's a little bit, I like to make the analogy to experimental biology. If you say, do you really know how your experiment works in every detail, or why you had to change this or that, I think most people would admit they don't that they have intuitions, okay, maybe I should change the salt concentration, maybe I should do this or that, but you experiment, and as you do more of this, you start to develop an intuition on your local system, and machine learning is kind of a similar way, that there's a mix of knowing what you're doing, and then there's a mix of kind of intuition and test, and one of the lovely things about working in machine learning that I really appreciate is you could get an answer of how very wrong you are very fast. <laughs> and. Um, you know, very good, very successful machine learners are ones that only fail nine times in 10. Um, and uh, I don't think that's so different than really great lab biologists. But then, okay, how do we go back and figure out what, how does this system solve this? What does it know? And you really have to experiment. What things does it understand about physics, about evolution? And one of the experiments that was very informative is we wanted to say, well, what's happening? And this represents kind of that same two track, the evolutionary track and the kind of physical track here. Well, what did it know at every moment? And we had, I said, 48 layers, and we actually run it four times, so it's 192 layers. And so what we did is we left AlphaFold fixed, but then we kind of probed it. And the probe is that we trained a small number of parameters to predict the protein structure after layer 19 and after layer 20 and after layer 21. So this is a way in which we can say, give us your best answer at layer 21, and we can use that to kind of say, the evolution of what it's learned is gonna give us some idea of how it works. And so this is one of the harder proteins to predict. It's very small, very fast evolving. This is Orphate from SARS-CoV-2. I think it has something like 70% sequence identity to Orphate and SARS-CoV-1. It's an extraordinarily fast evolving protein. Um, very small MSA. But what you can see on the right is the AlphaFold's best guess of the structure after each block of the network. And you can see this uh, counter, which I guess is jumping in tens, on what it learns. And you can see a fairly smooth learning. You see fairly late, for example, it learns to dock this strand. In fact, this is not quite enough steps to solve this. This would benefit from extra steps. But we see a relatively smooth evolution. And if we look at a much you know, larger example, this is an RNA polymerase you can see that fairly rapidly we're getting an overall structure and most of the time of the network is spent refining details and in fact for example if you look in the bottom left corner you'll see it takes a long time for this uh, domain to form and what we're really seeing that AlphaFold is doing is that it's iteratively updating it has a relatively strong belief about the structure right this looks quite smooth so over the course we're seeing a kind of smooth evolution of the structure and then we're seeing it build in. And in essence, what it's doing is it's finding different pieces that it believes in, and then it's starting to put them together. And so we think that AlphaFold has a fairly strong early hypothesis of what the structure is, and I'll talk about a little more evidence for that, and that most of the time an AlphaFold is spent refining in pretty physical uh, ways, in pretty um, 
kind of chemical complementarity, shape complementarity, really proper chemical physical concepts. Early on it uses evolution to get some of the initial idea, um, but after that it refines to what is ultimately a quite strong and precise prediction because ultimately this all fits together in some sensible way. Now the, the additional thing we really needed to do is we needed more than just the structure. And the reason we need more than just the structure is, of course, we're not always right. We're not always perfect. And we really needed to understand what to trust. And we really wanted people to be able to make decisions. Because ultimately, you know, we know that this structure may cause you to go down a year of doing some type of experiment or having a hypothesis that you test, that you debug. And we wanted people to do that when it was the right idea or when it should be believable. And so kind of there was always this question, kind of the historical approach was, well, we'll train a separate network to judge, you know, this. But, you know, what's the very world's expert in what a protein structure should be? Well, of course, it's AlphaFold, so what if we just ask it? <laughs> and uh, this is a fairly simple procedure. I don't have a diagram of the training procedure. But, it, but when we are training AlphaFold, of course, we know every structure. We take them from PDB. So it produces its answer, and we have it produce a second uh, thing that's called the PLDDT, which is just basically LDDT is a score we didn't invent um, that basically says how right is a given region, how right is the environment around a given residue. This is from, uh, I think, Torsten Sueda's lab. Really uh, neat tool. And so we said, okay, well, that's kind of a really useful distance measure. So we'll have AlphaFold predict the structure, and then we'll just ask it to guess the LDDT in each local region. And then, of course, in training, we can judge it on how accurate it is. And this is much like asking a student, you know, what's the answer to this problem? And then also asking them, so how do you think you did? Right? And often you know how you did without knowing the answer. You know, I think I got a, I think I got a C on this test. That doesn't mean you know which questions you got wrong, but you know about what fraction you got wrong. And I think it's a similar principle here, that as AlphaFold's building structure, refining structure, it can figure out, and I think some later evidence has really said, like, does this residue environment make sense? Is this a plausible structure? And so we found actually, and one of them, I'll talk about a little bit later about their relationship with disorder, one of the scarier moments of the project, but we found really that this worked pretty well as a course estimate, and I think a lot of people um, have kind of learned the blue and red, and red was definitely chosen as danger. If you, if you believe that, you're probably not going to go well. Um, <laughs> But then the other thing we found, and this was actually from a reviewer comment asking, well, okay, you predict LDDT, but I, I like TM score. Can you predict TM score? Um, but we ended up with this thing called PAE, and if you don't use it, you really should, if you use AlphaFold, which you should. But, um, <laughs> but what we really wanted to say is it's not really as complex as a protein structure is. It's not really right to say something is right or wrong. It has right aspects. It has wrong aspects. It induces some hypotheses you should believe. Some hypotheses you should doubt. And so if you take um, a protein like this with tons of domains on a string, for example, or tons of domains in sequence, you know, we're reporting relatively high confidence, kind of light blue here. But do we really believe that it coils around like this, that it's tagliatelle, right? And how do we know it's not spaghetti? And do we really believe this relationship? And so what we ended up coming up with from a couple of things is we said, OK, well, What's really true is like, what about these pairs of residue and so, residues? And of course, we already had pairwise information. You saw it earlier in my talk. So we trained this model to say, or trained this additional head in the same way. We did it on crystals of, OK, for residue 700, and it's, relate, and it's kind of geometry relative to residue, say, 800. Do you believe it? And you can kind of see the domains here. And sometimes we believe the cross-domain interactions. And each of these basically say is the position and orientation of one residue right uh, relative to another. And this is really, really important because PLDDT mostly reflects domain, and, uh, domain confidence. It doesn't change a lot for interdomain. Whereas this can tell you about any distance or interaction whether the model believes it. Now, it's you know, not a promise that it's right, although there's been a lot of interesting work that says things like, the value of the PAE is very predictive of whether something will be a cross-linking violation in a chemical cross-linking experiment. So there's been lots of nice work correlating these. But in the same way as you really shouldn't believe the red portions of the structure, if, whether you like the, the 
the geometry between residue 500 and residue 2000, we are saying nothing about it. And this is especially true, for example, in multi-domain membrane proteins, where you should be really cautious. Sometimes we will have two things that like, are not plausible. It looks like two things are in the membrane. But the vast majority of the time, we also report no confidence in that particular relationship. So this is what tells you on a residue pair level where we're confident. You know, what do, you, do we think you should base kind of future experiments on? And I think even more, and we don't have side chain measures, and we probably should, but we really kind of one of the lessons we learned afterwards is we really need to align confidence with the decisions that we think people are going to make, which are ultimately the hypotheses they're going to draw after looking at that. And it's not normally one, one metric, but many that are needed to report on the many hypotheses you may draw from the structure. Now, training confidence measures, and I'm being a bit ahistorical here, but I'll apologize later. Um, but we had a second benefit, that when we trained earlier versions of AlphaFold, we had some confident predictions and some non-confident predictions. And so we came up with this idea, and it was uh, independently published in the meantime, so the, called noisy student self-distillation, which said, well, if you're really, really confident in the answer, isn't that a bit like training data? Isn't that a bit like a real structure? Now, we didn't just do that on intuition, of course. We measured really well, and it does help. But the idea is that we train a model on the PDB. We predict a bunch of structures. We throw out all the ones that we're not confident about. But then we treat the rest a bit like experimental data. And so the final version of AlphaFold is actually trained three quarters of it on data from an earlier version of AlphaFold and one quarter on PDB, because that turned out to be the best ratio. And, uh, and there's some technical details, like we make the problem harder when we predict it for AlphaFold by reducing the MSA and some others that we don't do here. But basically, we expand our training set quite a bit by our own predictions, but in a carefully controlled manner, not in a hope manner. We also do some work that I won't go into very much, but we, to help it find the evolutionary signal, we have lots and lots of protein sequences, so we do it similar to what would be called, what uh, was also independently published as MSA transformer, where we have it predict you know, we hide some of the residues in the uh, multiple sequence alignment, and we say, what's here? And that forces the model to think deeply about phylogeny, covariation, et cetera. And that helps it, gives it representations that are used for structure. So we actually train a model to predict many related aspects of the protein problem. And in all cases, this makes things a bit better. Now, you know, we kind of got to the end of the project. We're writing the paper. Which parts mattered? And um, so there were kind of two answers here. One is over the course of the project, of course, we saw you know, what improved. We used a stable test set. Now, what we found is nothing was very big. You know, there were beautiful ideas that we loved and were super proud of and everyone loves. Um, triangular interactions, recycling, all these things are great fun. And there are ideas that you know, we don't talk about very much and someone changed the number from 8 to 16. And we kind of had a philosophy that if that's worth 1%, then we like it just as well as the really beautiful ideas. And took a very kind of practical, and it helps also do team science, because you can argue whose idea is beautiful and you'll never resolve it. But you, know, you can argue whose idea measures better, and you will resolve that very rapidly. But, uh, but also, we kind of come back and we said, all right, well, afterwards, for the paper, we trained a model. Now, very technically, we trained it. Um, without distillation, because that adds a, quite a bit, doubles the expense of training it. So we measured distillation as a knock-in, and we measured everything else as a knock-out. Um, and what we found is that everything mattered a bit, and nothing mattered a lot. And so this is kind of accuracy, difference with baseline. And we got a little bit contradictory on all PDB chains versus uh, a particular Cas14 set. But in general, all these ideas, and I didn't talk about all of them, so you didn't miss it. But all of these ideas were worth a bit. Now, some of the double knockouts, like we tried one double knockout of knocking out two things that we think had complementary purposes, that mattered more. But all of this is still much better than AlphaFold 1 or any other structure prediction system. So all of these were kind of, you know, even the, even the kind of biggish ones were small potatoes in comparison to everything else. So we had many small effects that we were able to put together and many, many ways in which we got a bit better. And this is not uncommon in technological development that you know, instruments get better, or electron microscopes get better. And it's not we had, you know, we'll tell a story of you know, whatever, direct photon or direct uh, 
electron counting or whatever it is, but there's actually many, many sub-innovations within there that make a technology. And we definitely observe that effect here. And so we, we shouldn't hang on any particular thing, should really hang on the development process, the kind of intuition that we're going to build this, how we measured it, et cetera. And that seems to be what makes the difference overall. Now, kind of results, and you know a bit about results. It's, uh, you know, I've ruined the drama, but, uh, and some of the extensions. I mean, first is, and I think I would just want to really make this a, a shout out to, you know, I like to say again and again, measure well. I think the very, very gold standard of measuring things almost in all of biology in terms of computational tools is CASP. This is uh, an external assessment. It really started in 1994 because there were lots of claims that protein structure prediction was solved. Um, and you know, you can go back and see John Malt and Christoph Fidelis' talks where they talk about lots and lots of claims in the literature, no one quite knew what was true, and so um, John and Christoph and others got together and said, okay, okay, if it's solved, then you wouldn't mind if we do a little test. And, uh, and so what they did is they said, they talked to their experimental colleagues and said, can we borrow your structure for two or three weeks? We'll hand the sequence to all the predictors, but we won't tell them the structure, and you know, while you're in review, and it hasn't been deposited in the PDB, and we'll really see how people do. And the results were extraordinarily definitive um, in the early CASPs that we were not anywhere on this problem and that we had tricked ourselves because, of course, you know, the method didn't work on that protein, but it's expensive. And then I changed this and I added that term and now it works. And now I'll publish showing you the result that I knew the answer to and I optimized against. But the, and so, like, really CASP set the standards, about 100 proteins, really set the standard in how do we measure. The other thing that I think they really got right is pretty much everything's allowed if you don't use a pipette. I mean, I don't even know if they specifically disallowed pipettes, but you only have three weeks to give an answer or two weeks, so it'd be hard to do. But it really said, whatever works, but let's measure whether or not this field works, whether or not people should trust it. Um, of course, we did very well. We had about a third of the median error of other groups, but I think it's really important as we think about computational tools. And working in MD, I think people don't really know what works, so there's still a lot of it's very hard to measure in its part because it's so expensive, it's hard to do 100 protein scale, it's hard to say what experimental data you predict. But thinking about this and measuring it really well is a catalyst for progress. Now we've released it, of course many of you have used the protein structure uh, database, so we released with about 330,000 predictions, uh, um, one per uh, protein code, you know, longest isoform I think on 21 model organisms. We now included 200 million, so almost everything in Uniprot. Um, now, they're, of course, predictions. They're at scale. They are enabling some really interesting new science. Like, one of my favorite things is when people come out with an unknown density in cryo-EM, and they've been able to show that they can search the associated genome or proteome in AlphaFold database for what fits in that density, and they're actually able to pull it down often and, and confirm with uh, biochemical experiments or molecular biology experiments. But yeah, there's a lot of predictions. They're available. We're starting to see, I think, interesting and new types of science. And of course, we release predictions for the whole human proteome. And you know, this is trying to say, and I can't remember exactly what, this is kind of what we would consider experimental knowledge. This includes a, templates at some reasonable um, sequence identity. And you can see the dark blue is high confidence, light blue is medium confidence, yellow is being generous. But you can see quite a bit of added structural coverage, including in things like membrane proteins, et cetera. So we really are adding a lot. Actually, one of the interesting things where we add the least uh, structural coverage, according to, I can't remember whose analysis it was, but was um, cancer driver mutation, cancer driver genes. Because it turns out every single cancer driver gene the NIH has paid for someone to uh, produce a structure of. But even there in protein interactions and others. Um, but another interesting question is, okay, we put out all these predictions, we did everything else, but what about all this context that we know matters? What about all the things that experimentalists care about? And if you think about it, Anfinson's phrasing of the protein structure problem was a bit wrong, right? He says, you know, you, uh, from the sequence uniquely specifies the structure. Um, of course, that's not really true. Well, in what oligomeric state? Are there ligands, DNA binding, pH? thermal fluctuations, everything. This is an underspecified problem. And in fact, and AlphaFold is relatively tolerant to this, and it solves what I like to call the PDB telephone problem, that your friend called you up 
and said, I've solved a structure. Would you like me to tell you the coordinates? And doesn't tell you all the conditions they used. And this is important because we can't know all the conditions across the genome. And so, for example, it's not correct to say that alpha fold is an APO structure because you can't see the ligand. If you do a heme binding protein, you'll find a heme shaped hole coordinated where two histidines are coordinating absolutely nothing. And uh, it's not doing this because it's crazy, it's doing this because it's inferred that there are proteins that this motif is associated with heme shaped holes. Can't put a word to it, of course. Um, but we see similar things around, say, zinc binding sites and even interestingly on homomeric proteins. By the way, what time do we end? Well, I, I, at least one question. Um, <laughs> and so we, we find it's interestingly tolerant to it because it has to be because the PDB is extremely diverse and contains all these things. We do, of course, if you give it correct context and alpha fold multimer, it often works better. This is a heteromeric protein. So I will say give it correct context when you can. It's sometimes important. But the network is somewhat tolerant and reports in its confidences generally. One of the other kind of interesting stories was, all right, we had alpha fold early on. We ran, all right, we'll just pick random proteins from Uniprot and run them. And they looked like the bottom right, and we panicked. And we said, oh my goodness, alpha fold must only be good at the kind of proteins that are deposited in PDB, whatever those are. You know, we never produced what would later be called spaghetti. Um, we called ribbons at the time. Um, you know, what's going on? And then, of course, someone looked up uh, the Uniprot annotation and said, oh, that's a disordered region. And it turns out, actually, alpha fold is a quite competitive predictor of disorder just when it fails to produce structure. <laughs> um, I, don't know, I don't know if we're absolute best, but we're very competitive on this, which is very, and like especially some of the more refined analysis like um, uh, Mazaros and Davy have done. Now, the place where this really fails is when uh, there's lots of heterotypic contacts. Then it'll often be disordered or not. No, in, in kind of homomeric cases, it sometimes can. I'll kind of rush. The other interesting story is we released it thinking, you know, we had released a, you know, this is great. We had lots of great ideas. Now we're going to go make an, a multimer system. We're going to predict heteromers, you know. We didn't actually stop and try, well, what if we do the silliest possible thing? And I think even someone I talked to suggested, well, what if you just put two domains together with a glycine linker? And I said, no, that's not how it works. <laughs> of course, then... Uh, about two days after this work came out, and there was, some, uh, there was also some work from the Baker Lab and Rosetta Fold, is someone going, well, you know, I tried it and it worked. And then, <laughs> right, that you can put this together. And I think what this is really reflecting is a lot of physical knowledge. It's not doing this by coevolution. There's no paired sequences. This is about chemical complementarity and physics and physical understanding. I think it's one of the best pieces of evidence that there's actually lots of physical understanding here in this silly construct that you could make in a lab, and often do, it's a long linker, well, that works just great in alpha fold. It was kind of the first indication of what's become a very fertile field of what can we pull out of alpha fold that we didn't mean to provide. We trained a model. What else can we find in there? And Hassan and others have done incredible work in that. Of course, we did you know, train a model to predict this. We modified some things. It works. Um, it does better. It does, definitely does better trained to do this. Um, in a quantitative way, but I will say, uh, you know, it's still a quantitative way. Okay, I'm going to rush a little. We've also, there's been a similar story on multiple states, and one of the sad parts about AlphaFold is when it gives you a perfectly reasonable structure of the wrong state, not the one you care about. And so um, there's been some really good work, so Del Alamo's from uh, Hassan's lab, and then Wayman Steele from uh, Dorothy Kern's lab, in saying, well, what if we do violence to the inputs? Can we get it to do multiple states? <laughs> and the multi-sequence alignment is important. What if we just give it less multi-sequence alignment? Um, and that produces a diversity of answers, but then those answers actually cover a lot of the important modes of the protein. So it's been very much a developing and experimental thing, and I think we're still developing these techniques. And there's some explanations given, but my favorite is kind of from some work by uh, Roni and uh, Ovchinikov in, this, in a PRL paper that has, I think, uh, not a great title for what it's about, state-of-the-art estimation of protein model accuracy using AlphaFold. But even if you don't care about protein model accuracy, this is an important thing that really kind of puts some more experiments to kind of show that what AlphaFold's doing is it's using the MSA at the beginning, but then it's refining into a structural basin. And what this work does in giving it less MSA is kind of giving it a randomization at the beginning and hoping it falls into a different basin. You can think of it as kind of 
trying the slot machine again and again and seeing which basins you land in. And I wouldn't say this is a turnkey procedure, but when it works, it can work really dramatically and produce interesting states. And AlphaFold, most of its capacity is spent refining. Most of the time, most of the kind of compute is spent going from, say, this place in the basin all the way to the bottom. And so your question is, how do you get it to find this basin and not another? And it's an evolving story. Um, kind of rushing applications, people apply it. Some really cool ones. Um, you know, AlphaFold turns out, AlphaFold is great at local details. It kind of builds structure locally outward, a bit like NMR structure determination. If you think about crystallography and especially cryo-EM, it does the opposite. It's a superposition of many particles. And so you get low resolution information. So the hardest part for AlphaFold is the overall, say, domain packing, domain interaction. The hardest part for cryo-EM is uh, the local atomic interactions. And so this is a match made in heaven. And often you'll get places like, oh, you know, here's the alpha fold structure. I don't know if I believe that. And then look, it fits right in the density. And so you're both validating the alpha fold structure and um, produce and giving atomic detail to these interactions. One of the most dramatic is several groups solving uh, the nuclear pore, which is an absolutely enormous complex. You know, I thought, there's no way alpha fold's gonna be relevant for complexes of this size, right? Hundreds and hundreds of protein chains. But it is kind of relevant. You can see it fits into some very coarse densities thanks to some great work from the Kaczynski and Beck labs. It's been used to find protein interactions and kind of what people are starting to call virtual pull downs. It's been used to give context, I'm now rushing as you can tell, give context to post-translational modifications. Interestingly, even though AlphaFold's not especially sensitive to point mutations, some really disappointing mutation results, it's actually very effective at filtering protein design. So people have noticed things like 10x larger protein design success rates by checking if AlphaFold reports the structure you meant to design for. Um, and this has been very, very successful recently in protein design. Some really exciting work on, I'm just, now this is all, by the way, external work that we didn't, weren't involved in. It's great fun when people use your tools to do fun things, right? Engineering uh, targeted, uh, targeted protein delivery into cells. I think it's really exciting where you know, the thing that people really needed to know was the geometry of the linker and how this recognition works so they could replace it with a protein design. Uh, they've shown that. Some really interesting work on a new protein degradation pathway, and I'm skipping all this because I was too optimistic. Um, and I think kind of as we get to the end, what is it gonna take to do this again? And okay, there's lots, you know, there's lots more data in PDB, there's lots more we can learn, but what is it going to really take for us to solve more scientific problems or to have bigger scientific breakthroughs in other areas in cell biology, what does it need? And I think really one of the stories of the last few years is that your da data, you want as big a data as you can find. And in fact, you'd rather have a big data set of the problem that you didn't quite want than a small perfect data set. That it's really that bigger, more general problems give more space for the machine learning to learn really deep facts about it. Um, also, when you're doing this, I think we're going to have to think a lot about how do we adapt this, that we can't just assume we're going to take off-the-shelf machine learning. We have to adapt it. And improvements here can be worth orders of magnitude in data. So problems that we thought, oh, yeah, and I mean, after AlphaFold 1, there was a lot of, oh, that's great, but the PDB is not growing by orders of magnitude, so you can't go any further in. AlphaFold 2 was trained on the exact same fraction of the PDB as AlphaFold 1 and was dramatically better. And so we've got lots of opportunities in architecture and really evaluating well. And you can't assume either capabilities or limitations, right? You can't assume that it's mutation sensitive. You can't assume anything else without rigorous testing. Um, you know, these ML often solves problems in ways that defy expectation. And that trained test split should really look like how you want to use it in anger and how your colleagues are going to use it before doing experiments. Um, and I think I'll probably skip this except to really make the point that you've got to stack 1% improvements. So you have to measure big, diverse problems in order to be able to get really low noise evaluation that enables us to make progress. That noisy evaluation means everyone publishes papers and goes to conferences and argues and no one can resolve that argument. And really you need, we need to get better as a community at measuring how good our tools really are, where they fail, and when one tool is ever so slightly better than another so that we can compound those improvements. And if we do that right, then hopefully we can take sparse data in other fields and make it big data. With that, I want to thank everyone who made AlphaFold possible. 
both at DeepMind and especially uh, Imbol EBI, who uh, were great partners in releasing the database and really the reason that the database is usable and lots of great feedback on how it should be so that people use it well and do the right experiments based on it, the CAST community, and especially the people whose data on which we trained, including many of you. Thank you. The overfitting is the enemy of all machine learners. For people that don't know, that's when you do really great on your training set and really bad on your evaluation set. And um, we did it in kind of two stages. One is that we didn't even care about training accuracy. If it was very, very accurate on the training set, we didn't care. It's seen the training set. And so when we would train machine learning models, we would use what's called a validation set, where we would only look at that. So. So already it's data that the network never saw in training where we measure ourselves. And then actually we had quite a bit of discipline because we knew we didn't have a very large validation set. So if you had the best validation network, then you could go run it on what we called the leaderboard, which was a new set of proteins that wasn't the validation set. Because if you keep making decisions in the validation set, then you get to overfit that. And so we had kind of this multi-stage procedure where having the what we would call SOTA, state of the art, S-O-T-A, uh, which just kind of pronounced like soda by the time everyone uh, says it in machine learning. But if you had soda on the validation set, then that gave you basically the right to go put it on the, on the test set, and that's really how we tracked our progress. And we tried to really create multiple, like everything you do is in a sense insulating you against overfitting, because it's very easy. I mean, you know, you can make a network with more parameters than the PDB has data, and you can just write all the answers in, but that's not what you want. You want something that learns and generalizes. So it's important to predict protein structure because, in a sense, the genome gives us the wrong view of, uh, of proteins. It gives us a linear view. So you sit there and you say, oh, here's a mutation associated with cancer. Here's a mutation. Here's a mutation. And then you look at the structure, and they're all right next to each other. That's what's close matters. It also matters because you start to get mechanistic uh, understanding. You start to say, and honestly, I should. I'm, I'm sitting here saying I'm explaining to John Curry and why we need protein structure. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but it gives us kind of, it, I, I would say the biggest reason we want it is it gives us a great tool for making hypotheses about how the cell works that we can ultimately test. And because it's so very hard to test and make sense of data, we need this kind of map of the protein. Now, it's not the only thing we need. We need lots more than that. We need motion. We need chemistry. We need lots and lots more, but this is, what we, this is what we have. This is what makes an enormous difference, and it gets us to the atoms. It's also the thing that connects both our genome to the, to the structure of the cell, not the only thing, but it also is the thing that connects atoms out to human health, which I think, as an ex-physicist, is the most extraordinary thing in the world. You can see the atoms, and a few atoms difference ultimately results in disease and phenotype and everything else. And this provides one step of that link. John. Nature uses chaperones to pull proteins. You mentioned context. Could alcohol use chaperones? So I will first say that a lot of what chaperones seem to do, at least the intuition, is that it helps you undo your mistakes. Um, I don't. I think AlphaFold does some of the effect of chaperones. AlphaFold isn't as trapped. So if it were a very physical system like molecular dynamics, you would be trapped in deep wells. It doesn't seem to proceed exactly physically. It's not required to obey kind of Boltzmann entropies. At the same time, I think some of chaperone effects are probably reflected in some places uh, within this. I think there's also maybe another question is like folding off the ribosome and pausing and other things, and I think it's an open question how much that's reflected, and that's part because you have the evolutionary data, that however you got to the final structure, your sequences reflect that that structure must be stable. So evolutionary structure prediction is giving you a shortcut so you don't have to think quite as much about chaperones, I think. So this was actually a fairly small algorithmic change um, that we did. It's really two things. So it's a data update and a training update, primarily. Uh, so the data update is we 
So we had previously, for the entire Alphafold project, had used April 2018 as the last date. So when people want to know, is my structure in Alphafold training, I just say, well, what's the release date in PDB? Um, and so we moved that forward a couple years to, I think, September 2021. Now, one thing that includes is that like doubles the amount of cryo data or more, right? There's been a big distribution shift. So we have more long proteins. Now, associated with that, there's a very technical thing where we don't actually, for a large structure like the ones you see, we don't, give, we don't train on the whole thing for computational reasons. AlphaFold's very slow on big proteins, as I imagine many of you have noticed. And so, and training involves million, tens of millions of samples. So what we do is, in um, AlphaFold Multimer, we would take a 384 residue slice out of the protein, and we would train on that. We'd take a random slice, and if we saw the protein again, we'd take another random slice. Now, for very technical reasons, it, it seems to work that you can predict proteins maybe about eight times larger than the one you train on, and this is empirically measured. There's no you know, beautiful mathematical theory that I have for it. Um, and, but for very large proteins, we'd notice what we would call length collapse, that we, predictions would degrade in accuracy if it's very long. And we still have some of that, I should say. So we, train, we tra did the last section of training at a much longer, I think, 640 residues. And so that gave us more accuracy on long structures. And so you give that by, say, a factor of 8 or 10. Um, so you can go out to maybe 5,000 residues, total complex size. And so those two, I mean, is really quite small changes of doing those two things, made a pretty reasonably large difference in the ability to handle large structures. And I, I wouldn't imagine. And it's not really about changes in GPU power. It's really just about some simple tweaks and a bit more data, and especially more large in cryo-EM. I, I think we should wrap up, but I want to ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it's sort of uh, looking yeah. forward, uh, vision, you know, vision. Uh, so the next step, one of the next steps, is protein networks and thinking about protein networks and, and speculate for us about the, the amount, so, you know, there's something that you didn't talk about, sort of the state complexities of, yeah. that associated with the problem the machine learning is trying to solve. And, and I think DeepMind has the AlphaGo first, and that says maybe protein state complexity is doable. What about networks? What about, do we have the data, do we need the data to model network at atomic resolution? So I think there's a couple of, things here on networks. And I don't, I, the state complexity argument, I, I, don't, I don't like to make it as much because if you're not careful, you can get huge state complexities. For example, you can predict a protein structure in a thousand random bits. And okay, you didn't do very well in the random bits, but the protein structure was still good. It's about the, the, what you wanted to learn. And so on networks, I'll, I'll say, what's the question? Do you want to know how it changes? Are you looking at the dynamics of the network? And when you get to that question, what data do you have to support that question and how big is it? And of course, PDB is both you know, 200,000 structures now, 140 or so when we were doing this. And they're very like, high dimensional, lots and lots of information per structure. And so what, what's the question, what's the measurement that you're doing in networks? And there are a lot of people doing things like gene expression and other things for, say, cell biology. But what are the questions you want to ask and answer? I get to ask a question, I guess, at the end. Oh. <laughs> but, yeah. Okay, so uh, John would be a 